welcome you all back to this our show, Think Tech-wise Human Humane Architecture. This happens to be our 259th show and you're on our 13,909 viewer. It's all about the number nine today. And us is you, DeSoto Brown, in your Bishop Museum. Hi, DeSoto. Good morning. Good day, everybody. And it's me, Martin Despang, in my Grand Hotel in Waikiki's bathroom, broadcasting live from the same place in Honolulu, Hawaii. And if we can get the first slide up, we want to jump right back in where we had left last time. And this is making the connection between the two cities we're looking at. And which are these, DeSoto? We are looking at Honolulu and Chicago. Both of them do have some similarities. They're both on waterfronts, but our climate conditions are extremely different. That's very relevant for the buildings that we discuss because Chicago has to deal with extremely cold weather along with very hot, humid weather. We are fortunate enough to not have those extremes, but there are a lot of similarities in that we have a lot of skyscrapers or a lot of tall buildings. So how those buildings are created and who's doing them and what innovations they show are something that we can apply to both locations. Absolutely, and our ongoing investigation, uh, that just so to make sure we're not getting paranoid about the similarities, um, there is a BIS journal article from a while ago that says our imported skyline, we import a lot of things here, too much, almost everything, we don't make anything anymore on the other hand. So we also import architecture and skylines. And we just have a new proof of evidence for that. And this is the slide here that we, because Howard Hughes is keeping building in the Kaka'ako area. And this here is their newest proposal that's gonna go up pretty soon. And that is, we're still having to uh, share your new archiving material that you just recently shot that shows uh, this site, how it is currently still is and will soon no longer be. And until then, please describe a little bit where the location is and what we have there uh, still now and soon not anymore. Yeah, Okakaako is known as being a light industrial district of Honolulu, and that's something it evolved into in the 20th century, because before that it was previously just low-rise uh, individual homes and wooden houses. And so today, it, this particular site is what had been built in the 1960s as a discount store, which us old guys will remember as GEM, G-E-M, and that was a members only store like Costco is kind of. And in addition to the gem store, which became a variety of other businesses over the years, there were other small builds, buildings built on the site, which had a variety of restaurants and other small retail stores. So this is going to go from a lot of open space for parking, as well as low rise buildings to again, one single dominating high rise, which is what the Howard Hughes Corporation continues to do, has been doing, and is continuing to do in what was called the Ward property in Honolulu in Kaka'ako. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there will also be one more in front of it, so Prime Waterfront, and that's where Steve Ow's um, Ward Plaza had to go, unfortunately, that we missed a lot, and that's been a parking lot ever since, hasn't been developed as soon as one would have wished, we would have wished for, because it was a great building. We could have had our pop-up interim school of architecture in there, which would have been much better than in our piece of cake, that we just got an email from our administration that they were filming, um, what is it called, CS. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, what's yeah, it called yeah. again, that crime series? Uh, that yeah, I can't, I can't think of the name just for, yeah, because me, you're asking me, me right either. this minute, me but either. yes, yes. <laughs> it's okay. It's not like Hawaii Five O, the original ones. That one we remember for reasons. The architecture was a distinctive actor in it, a tropical, exotic, distinctive actor. Not anymore. Now it could be in Miami or whatever. Uh, you know, high rise. They're not. They're, they're not treating tropically exotic. Exactly. So this one here is called. Will be called. Uh, is already branded to be the Park Ward Village. It's not to be confused with the Park. 
of the Midtown Ella Moana building that we've been doing uh, very, very many shows about it, but it has the same name. This is fronting that green zone. That's where it gets its name from. Then also the Kuula by Jeannie Gang, which uh, is uh, the one that we're making connections here because Jeannie is the main leading architect in Chicago as of now. And that's, this is this tower. And also uh, with this building, um, Chicago shows up, uh, not just, you know, across the park, Genie, but here is that firm that seems to really, um, you know, being washed over a lot from the shores of Lake Michigan to our shores of the Pacific, uh, uh, Pacific Island here. And that's Solomon Cortwell Buens. The first one they've been building was for Howard Hughes is the Anaha. That is, reminds us of intestines, even is sort of implied in the name, and has this weird curvy forms and no lanais. Uh, also, a show called uh, Top uh, Second from the Right is the uh, Ali E. Not that these names matter, because you confirmed this sort of that they're made up, they're branding names that have little to nothing to do with Hawaiian culture. They want to make a connection, but that's probably abusing your Hawaiian culture for commercial reasons here. And uh, there is also the big the picture um, second from the top right is one that we took when we were stuck with our second PIing mobile that Larry keeps uh, running. Uh, we have uh, today Suzanne and the boys will drive by Larry again because we have the second screw in the second tire and he is not giving up on us. So we took this picture when we were driving to him or front him, and that is Victoria Place. That is the boarding Alamoana Boulevard. It's a shocking one, but it has no lanais. And uh, they also ventured out into our hood here into Waikiki and did the Lilia that has some pretentious or pretending lanais that are not really worth the name. So here they come again, and an assessment here to the left, that rendering, is what we in the architectural education, when us coaches get frustrated, we call this pushing and pulling, what sometimes the emerging generation gets lured into, uh, working as a sculptor. And what might look sort of as an interesting way to give structure to the building is actually nothing else than basically pushing the glass of every fourth floor back in an angled way. So it seems, again, there is, um, you know, three-dimensional texture to the building. But again, it's only for the aesthetics. It doesn't do anything performatively. It casts a little bit of a shadow here if the orientation is right that we're looking at. But, you know, that little triangle isn't really helping to keep it cool. Otherwise, it is a glass box, once again, with these extruded um, uh, floor slabs that, once again, in the in the past haven't been thermally disconnected that german product that is there to do that hasn't been used so we are not that impressed again with this one here and the plan uh, at the bottom right shows it's the same old double loaded corridor that is keeping the breeze from flowing through there are uh, and the only innovative thing is an old thing from our favorite Alamoana building where they were sacrificing a little bit of rentable unit space to give light to the side of the tunnel to the elevator cores. And we see an uh, egress staircase that could be using the code change um, of uh, being um, you know, easy breezy again, but we don't know in this plan enough and the rendering isn't showing it from that side. On the other side, it's dead ended. So this is the same old 20th century, uh, not tropical exotic at all, but another pretty invasive species. Um, if you agree with that, the Soto. Yeah, I was just the, the one thing that, that struck me in what we were just saying here is uh, I thought there needed to be emergency stairways on both ends of a building, not just one end. So that would but that doesn't it, appear to be the case it, here. It, it is a little hard to see. There is one, but the, the one that is actually here on the, which they don't even go to the attempt, which we appreciate to use Hawaiian verbiage here. They call it mountains and not mauka. So they have the one that is attached to the side of the hallway up there at the top left. 
but the one that's to the ocean side is basically, um, you know, at the end of the corridor that dead ends before a very pricey unit because that's prime waterfront, right? And they didn't want to have a yeah. staircase that no one uses, yeah. unfortunately, yeah. to block that. So they, we can yes. also say they treat the Mauka, you know, we would say an external staircase in the century that was something to celebrate that people actually used and walk up and down. I do this here on the Waikiki Grand. But in reality, we're a minority. Most people don't do that. They use the elevator. So they put in the, the egress staircase there uh, where no one wants to be. And they don't put one there where there's this prime waterfront. So again, pretty disappointing. And then they seem to have a little bit of a bad conscious because in one of the realtors, um, you know, descriptions here, they say it was designed to have large Juliet balconies they even, they're at least fair enough to not try to call it even Lanai's, that can open to make the interiors feel like you are out on the Lanai. This way you can enjoy that feeling, yet not have to worry about wasted space and have to frequently clear your Lanai. I would say give us a break, right? Because I'd rather go through once a week cleaning my life, uh, Waikiki Grand Lanai than not having to have one. And what's it with these Juliet uh, balconies? We heard that before and discussed that before. And that way we bring back at least virtually our dear fellow Midwesterner that Chicago belongs to, Ron Lindgren. And let's go to the next slide and just remind us of what these Juliet Lanai's are, DeSoto. Well, the, the Juliet uh, Lanai or balcony refers to the famous play by Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet. And it has a famous scene in which Ro uh, Juliet comes out on a small balcony and calls to Romeo, where are, wherefore art thou Romeo? Well, this refers to sometimes not even really a balcony at all, but essentially uh, a railing on the outside of a very large floor to ceiling window or sliding door. Sometimes there's a very little tiny balcony that you could maybe step onto, but there's really, there's no place for any furniture, maybe a potted plant, but that's it. So that's referred to as a Juliet balcony. I'm not against the idea. I mean, the idea is perfectly nice. I don't think that, as you just said, that that really takes the place of a real lanai, nor would most people consider that a lanai to be, quote, wasted space that you, quote, have to keep clean. So it's better than being a glass box that doesn't open at all. But as to whether that is better than an actual lanai that you could go out onto, I don't think I would agree with that. Yeah, and show quote top ride. I think that other pink palace up there, if I remember correctly, was one that Ron grew up in, right? No, that or is was the it one you? that my, not my Oh, mother. that was yours. There you that, go. That right. was it. That's mm -hmm. the one that my mother grew up in, in San Francisco. And there it was a go. building, it's a high rise building built in the early 1920s. Yeah. And it has some Juliet balconies. And when we went to visit my grandparents there, I thought that the Juliet balcony in their apartment was kind of strange because what can you do with it? Um, and yeah. particularly there, because it was always cold. Well, Honolulu is not always cold. So a Juliet balcony, certainly, as I said, is a nice thing to have, but it isn't yeah. a replacement for a lanai. Yeah, and in the quote we were just reading before, they at least are honest because it really comes from the greedy factor that you basically, you know, have all the square footage rentable fully because a lanai only or a balcony only counts half, oddly, which also should be different here in our privileged tropical exotic tropics. But from a realtor, a monetary point of view, that's the thing. And that's why many of them get enclosed or got enclosed, which is bad. So here they're basically saying, OK, let's not even do any. But then we feel a little bit bad. So get more freeze in. Uh, but then it depends on what kind of guardrail you put in front of us. If you do the ones that we don't endorse, which is the glass guardrails, then it's not any better because then you have the fixed thing that doesn't allow any ventilation and you only have an opening above, which is then not much more than a window. And so what I confused, but now, so that was your grandma and you, but Ron's memory is the one that he designed and created. And these are the three different, uh, the three other show quotes. That is the 
uh, designed as the Waikiki Park Hotel, recently rebranded and for that reason remodeled uh, Hale Puna by Hale Polani, which Juan designed as well. And we were very critical about that renovation because um, the panels, the glass panels that were flush with the facade next to the lanais had these Juliet lanais. And uh, they were great because when you open the sliding door on the lanai, and in addition to that one, you got something that we called side ventilation. You get the breeze through the side, and that was great. In the renovation, they threw this out. They replaced it with a fixed glazing. So they were basically, um, you know, grading down, devaluing, devaluating that bioclimatic effect that Ron had designed. And we're saying developers, owners don't do that. And we're saying when there's the next renovating cycle here in some decades, please bring it back to the original. And for us here, and this is very relevant, particularly for other places in the world right now, energy usage goes up. You do not have any windows that can open here in Honolulu. And that is not as crucial for us, again, as it is for places like Chicago or Germany, where energy is going to be very tight this winter, coming winter. But regardless of that, even if we don't need heat to keep us alive, we do like to save on energy and save on our energy bills by utilizing natural air movement instead of forced air conditioning. Okay. So next slide, we're gonna return for two more slides to Jeannie Gang's most recent um, project in Chicago, which was initially the Vanda Vista Tau, which is now the St. Regis. And here we have another sort of similarity to one of the towers that was actually Howard Hughes's first, that's the YAR, a WCIP local firm. And they went so far to compare the inspiration to Hukilau. And that is how your ancestors were fishing in a very communal effect, very bioclimatically. Whenever there was a pregnant female fish, they threw it back in because they knew it's their future food, right? So we find that a little far stretched that building this wavy glass facade has something fundamentally and substantially do with these sustainable practices of your ancestors. So once again, more a sales pitch and a branding and also we see sort of a tragic similarity because um, I always tell the emerging generation that uh, at the end of a life cycle of a building, it costs eight times as much as its initial erection cost. And that is basically, of course, heating and cooling, uh, which unfortunately, you know, in, in the past had to be done in the future with post fossil buildings, not anymore but also the maintenance of buildings. And what if the issue the, do we see when the architects went through these efforts to make the glass not be vertical? Well, I'm looking at a picture that shows a lot of streaking on the glass. And uh, I assume that that's what you are talking about because I certainly see that in the large picture to the left of me or yeah, or to the right of me or wherever I am. Yeah, and that is again, this is this building is sort of, you know, having a sort of a, a periodic corseting going on. It gets tailored and then bigger and tailored and bigger. Uh, we can quickly go to the next slide. Um, and, um, you know, that's how it works and that's how it looks like. But going back to the previous slide, that's what it causes whenever the building is sort of not um, leaning inward, the facade, but leaning outward. Dust settles and dirt settles on it, just with the YAA. And you are not just getting, you know, dirty glass to look through, but you're also having, you know, more maintenance and having to clean the glass. And what do we clean glass with? With nasty cleaning materials. So this is all adding up to a nasty carbon footprint of the building. So emerging generations, think about the forms that you're creating and what kind of a genie or Jan out of the bottle people they are and you know what kind of effects and burdens they kind of cause right also we're quoting from Jeannie's uh, website here to the top left some you know I would say justifications about 
it's uh, you know bioclimatic performance or the absence of it. And maybe shame on me. I need uh, Jeannie's office to explain this more to me what they're talking about. I have the feeling as of now, it's basically trying to make something up. I, I don't I don't see any really good environmental performance behind the formal performance of the building. Um, it is a building that, again, because it's all glass, it can get some passive solar gain in the winter time, potentially, and probably likely it does because it's a pretty, you know, there are skinny towers or, you know, three skinny towers, you know, bundled together. So the sun is getting to it from all sides. The floor plans are not very deep. So in the winter condition, I, I give it the benefit of doubt that it would. But I'm sorry, in the summer condition, we also see these here very popular awning windows that kind of pop out and go only give a couple of uh, you know inches of air circulation. So they're not really doing doing much. So as of now, until someone tells us differently, this is fossil formalism. And uh, next slide again, which we already very briefly on. It for sure leaves it with a spectacular form that seemed to have been the intention of the studio gang office and um that might be it but again we already uh, gave the recommendation of howard hughes's tower that they did with another uh more towards the mid western or in that case actually east coast uh, architectural firm that's boland savitsky jackson and their building in and for howard hughes in kakaako that was they said you know if they would have used this german system of passive house performative uh, glass jealousies that are triple glazed and hold that uh, cold in the summertime that you create uh, inside and they keep the heat inside in the winter time. But at the time that we also have in the spring and in the fall in Chicago, which is what we have here all the time when the out outdoor temperature is close to what we found to be perfect for us and it equals for that reason the indoor air temperature then you would open them up so this is pretty much a missed opportunity also maybe we want to educate the audience about what we share the aqua and we chose and philip moiser and Bjorn rosen kindly followed our request to give the title page color uh, the one of our uh, pacific ocean here especially when the tides are low that very sort of uh, iconic turquoise color. Sometimes the Chicago River goes into this direction and we as well, and that fascinated you. Share that with the audience. So. <laughs> well, the river that runs through downtown Chicago every year is uh, dyed green for St. Patrick's Day, and that's one of the major things that they always do, and that's something everybody looks forward to every year. It is done in a non-invasive way that doesn't poison anything. And it originally got started uh, just by chance because they were trying to trace leakage into the river from uh, various like sewage systems or drainage systems. And it became aesthetically a thing that they want to do every year. So every year it gets dyed green and it's a bright green every for a few hours every St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, and along these lines, I was just recently talking to someone who asked me if I had been here when what the Jawain uh, band Green has a song dedicated to the 40 days of rain that you vividly remember, I don't because it, because before I came here two, uh, 10 years ago, but I was told that again, um, everything got rained into the Alawai and basically became the sewage and the swamp. Nothing worked anymore. And this is what you get when you dump your waste, your human waste into your precious uh, water. That, by the way, um, um, we have an aquifer here, you know, so we don't drink the ocean water that for that reason would have to get desalted. Uh, we uh, have the aquifer in Chicago. It's actually the Chicago, uh, the lake water that they basically drink. And when as rivers usually flow into the water, they were polluting their own uh, drinking water. For that reason, they did something engineeringly gigantic. They reversed the flow of the river and it basically flows back now uh, a little ironically into another river, which is the Mississippi River eventually. Then that goes into the Gulf of Mexico. So they like, you know, burden them with their stuff. 
And so for that reason, again, um, also, you know, the, 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 the flow had to be reversed uh, for the reason of not polluting, polluting the river. So that um, some sort of stories of our uh, water coast uh, that we share and uh, how that sort of green color then seems to reappear on the surface is sort of walking up, but not as, as we propose it in Primitivas as water curtain walls, which by the way, would not work in Chicago because you basically get, I was once actually at um, Niagara Falls in the winter and I saw when that freezes over, you get the frozen Niagara Falls, which is really a spectacle. Nice to look at if you're bundled up in your, in your puffy jacket, but to try to reside behind that is not a good idea. It doesn't work. But we don't have that freezing, so you could sit behind a water curtain wall all year round and enjoy it. Not so much in Chicago. So uh, next slide, look at it only for another minute because then we're at the end of another exciting 28 minutes. But we see that green or blue glass here appearing on buildings. Uh, this is by an architect here um, who, um, his name is uh, David Hovey, I believe. Yeah, there it is, uh, uh, written out <laughs> at the top left. He's an architect who Dan, our mentor of this show here, told me was acquainted with Helmut Jan. And he did a project in Arizona that I remember from my desert day um, at the top right. <clears throat> that, however, was working with way more uh, biochromatic systems as vegetation, uh, which this, uh, uh, you know, two towers here pretty much uh, don't uh, do at all, which is unfortunate. Okay, uh, more about our two windy cities uh, next week. And until then, please all stay tropically exotic, exotically tropic. Bye bye. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.